Hello everyone. Welcome to this session. And thanks for joining after three days. A lot of information. I am sure that you guys are already overflowed. <laughs> that like, so when I saw the schedule, then I actually reduced my session because after three days, nobody will have appetite to long for a long session. So we are going to talk about engineering management today. And uh, just before I start, a little bit of my background. I'm Saleh Hin. I'm managing engineering team for PayPal as a senior engineering manager. And I have over 16 years of experience in the industry. And I was managing teams in Bangladesh, Chennai, Singapore, and now in USA. I have over eight years of experience in management. So that's why I want to discuss about this. So engineering management, how I see engineering management. I see this is a combination of managing people, managing technology, and managing conflict. And these all three are very meaty subject. And it, I will not do justice if I try to cover all of them today. So I'm just going to focus on managing people as much as possible today. So why I choose this one? Why I'm thinking about engineering management in, as a topic to discuss? Because, because of the industry growth, we see that a lot of in companies are expanding, as well as a lot of startups coming in. So when there is a new uh, companies coming in, as well as the companies expanding, you need new team, and you need managers to manage those teams. And because of that, this role, a number of roles is coming in market more, and the importance also becoming more significant. And career path, career path is not really maybe true for Bay Area, but other regions like APAC region and other regions, after some time, engineers want to go to management. They see that this, that is their next step in career. So like those markets are not ready for engineers for 20 years, 25 years of experience. So they look for a management role. And organizational structure, organizational structure also changing a lot nowadays. Most of the organization are matrix organization, and they also have uh, now most of the organization practice agile methodology, and there are smaller teams there, so need more frontline managers. So there is a need for engineering management. So to manage a team, you need a team first, and you need to build a team. So you need to hire people. I see hiring is a project. So you have to decide that how many engineers or what are the roles you want to hire, what level of engineers you want to hire. And do you want only engineers? Do you need any, anyone else uh, on the team, any other roles? And even in engineers, what type of seniority you want? Junior engineers, senior engineers, how many of them you want? If you know all of these, then can you will start your hiring project. And also, that what is the ultimate goal of your team? what the team going to deliver. If you know that, it will be easier for you to hire accordingly. There are changes happen because you may build a team for one goal, but in the long run, it changes to a different goal. And, but still, you need to hire people based on what you have in current information. And once you have this information, you can, and also you want to know that what is the timeline for you, then you can start this hiring project. And to start hiring, you need hiring pipeline. How you want to you hire people? You can use your personal network. If you have personal network and if you can hire through this, this is the best solution, like family, friends, alumni, ex-colleagues, because you know all of them. And you, you know that how they are going to fit in your team. So it's really easy. But it's not always the case that you can use these resources. You can use communities, meetups, conferences, like this type of conference for interaction, and you see how people are participating there. Then you can hire, use those information as for your hiring. And you can use recruiters. Recruiters, I want to say that there are two types of recruiters, right? We always work internal recruiters and external recruiters. And internal recruiters is like whatever you have in your, in your organization, you have to use that. And for external recruiters, there is a catch that you have to find out the best one who can do the research for you, who can find out the person for you. And at the same time, that recruiter needs to consider both party, not only your consideration, also the engineer's consideration, so that it can satisfy both sides. Nowadays, I'm not sure how many people see job advertisement other than 
websites uh, like Hyde.com or Indeed or LinkedIn, but not in the newspaper and other places. Maybe some of the roles may be applicable, but not in general. I'm not sure how people use that. So now you know that what is your requirement, what type of team you are building, what the resource you are going to hire people. Then you are thinking about hiring senior engineers. And for that, what are the resources you're going to use? So you can use references. Definitely, it really works with good with uh, senior engineers. Community, LinkedIn, and sometimes executive recruiters. If you can use executive recruiters, because they're going to use, they're going to do research for you, and you, you can use the, those research information. And for the interview panel, senior manage, engineers, definitely managers. And I would say, therefore, this is really important to involve stakeholders for senior engineers, because in matrix organization, they have to work with multiple teams. They have to work with different teams and connect with different teams to discuss priority, dependencies, all this. So, and as well as they had to interact with business teams. So if you don't involve the stakeholders, you may not choose the right person. So I'll go quickly on the mid-level engineers, engineers because uh, this is a common panel we always use, like open source contribution, job sites, and as well as senior engineers managers will be in the hiring panel. You can include junior engineers there. They're going to be interesting because uh, how they behave with junior engineers in the team environment, you want to see that one. Hiring junior engineers is really interesting because you don't have much background information about them. You may have, if you want to hire RCG, recent college graduates, you only have the academic background, nothing else. So how you want to choose them? You can use university events, hackathon, programming contest side like Top Coder and other things. You want to see the best on their technical skills. If they are good on their technical skills, you can guide them on their leadership skills and the team dynamics, how they are going to perform on teams. So Hackathon Programming Contest is a really, really good option for them. And same interview panel, we can use that one. So now you know that you want to have all the soldiers in, in the horizon, but whom you want to hire. Do you want to hire iOS engineer? Do you want to hire Android engineers? Which level of engineers you want? They, all the soldiers are good, but what you need, you have to choose. And based on that, you have to assemble your team. And to assemble your team, you also need to think about your team structure. What I mean by team structure, that what the team will do uh, is going to be a delivery team. You want a team only focus on similar, like any other teams works in agile environment that whatever assigned to them, they will deliver that one. Or you want a functional team. So you can build a team only for the UIs. You can build a team only for QAs. There is nothing right or wrong on that. It depends upon the need and depends upon the organization structure. I also worked in an environment where we had hybrid teams, functional team as well as delivery teams. So you know your hiring plan. You, you have the hiring pipeline. You, have the uh, interview panel, you are hiring depending on your need. Now, if you need a high hybrid teams, definitely your organization need to support that one. So from that point of view, you have everything to build the team. But it's still engineering management becoming difficult day by day. Why it is? Because increasing, increasing cultural and skills diversity in the team, involvement in engineering decisions, and I'll go Briefly with this, why increasing culture and skills diversity in the team is really making it difficult. And at the same time, it's in actually bringing power. Because you have to understand the diversity in the team. You have to acknowledge that and feel that diversity is a power. It's not only in the theory. You have to really believe on that. And you have to foster a culture in the team so that everybody believes in that and use that power. So nowadays, a lot of people move here and there and different uh, organization and different countries. So they add these cultural values. If you understand that, if you try to believe in that, then you can use that power. And 
based on that, if you build an environment where they can open up, that will get the, then you can get best out of them. If you don't have an environment where engineer cannot open up, you will not able to make a team that can perform, and you will only get a mediocre product. So involvement in engineering decision, this is an interesting area. A lot of people want to disc, uh, uh, have different opinion that whether an engineering manager need to code or not. Whether I, I would say that it's personal choice that whether you want to code or not, whether you want to involve in the uh, code review. But doesn't matter that whether you whether you code or not, you have to be involved in your technical solutions discussion. You have to understand what your team is delivering, what type of dependency your team is going to face from technical point of view, and also the limitations your team is actually bringing in, what the solution they are sol providing, it may bring some limitations. And if you don't understand that those things, you will not be able to guide the team, support the team, and remove the blocker for the team when you work with other teams, when there is a question about dependency or there is a question about delivery. So you have to involve in technical discussions. You have to know what is going on the ground. So now, because of the different technologies, it's become very hard because you maybe worked as a web engineer and become a manager. Now your team is delivering a mobile app. So it may be hard for to understand that what is going on in your team, what is going on in, in your team's technical discussion, uh, discussions, and why they are taking this type of decision, because it's different technology. And doesn't matter which label you are working, maybe you're senior manager or director or VP, you have to be involved in this type of discussions. And Matrix organization is, has its own complexity, right? And like if you think about that, when we have to deliver something, we ha may have a deliver uh, dependence with the service team. You may have a dependence with the legal team and uh, globalization team. So e unless you make your I mean, prioritization aligned with their prioritization and work with them, you will not be able to deliver. You, it's not only that your piece can go along. Uh, so you have to have convinced other team mem teams and other other stakeholders to deliver your product. So now the question about the motivate the team to delivery, right? So if you don't understand individuals in your team, you will not able to deliver. You have to interact with your in engineers. You have to understand individually. If you know your team, what is individually the need, and that will make the whole team's need, and then you can deliver and motivate the team. So the, here is a one thing I want to highlight that like setting clear goals is not only the delivery goals because that may come from the product manager, that may come from the PMO, that okay, what is the delivery for next sprint or the sprint after. What you have to do, you have your company goal, company vision, and your team is working here as a junior. So you have to connect the dots that okay, this is my company vision, and this is the strategy my company is doing, and next quarter we are planning to deliver this one, or following quarter we are going to plan, pl deliver this one. How my, our work is actually impacting that, how our work is helping on the KPI. If you can connect this dot, team will be motivated. They will see that, okay, their work is actually making an impact. Now, on the evaluation is always about evaluation and rewarding the teams. It's not only evaluation, you have to reward the team. And this is a common picture we always saw in Facebook and other areas, right? And the reason I use this one, because we always think about a measurable criteria to evaluate teams, team members. And it's good if you have a measurable matrix, if you have something you want to tangibly measure. But sometimes it's very hard for the senior engineers or senior level roles to measure more with data. So you have to understand how you are going to measure for your team on that. At the same time, I want to give one example that I I'm think we all work in ideal environment, but there in a, practically there are some of the companies you have to assign your team member for a specific job. Maybe you assign your team member 
to support live, live issues for next two quarters. And end of these two quarters, you are evaluating that team member with other team members who are actually working on delivery. So even though whatever task you assign to him, he delivered right, what is, whatever the task you assign to him, he did it with 100% devotion and quality, and everything is there. But when you are going to evaluate with other team members, if you use the same skill, you are not doing justice with this, this person. So you have to be very careful when you say that, okay, I need a common ground. Before you set a common ground for everybody, you have to set a common assignment for them also. So, and it also makes more complex when you go for uh, inter-team uh, calibration. That's also really interesting because you have to wait for that, like how you want to portray your messages on during the calibration, how you want to portray his performance during the calibration. So when you do the evaluation, you, there will be some low performers, and this is common. Doesn't matter how your team, how efficient your team is, how good your team is, there will be some low performers. And this is a common interview question for engineering managers, how we deal with low performers. I said like, honestly, we should, should see the root cause of performance. We have to see the trend of performance. Is he performing low for last two sprints, three sprints, or two months, three months, or he has been performing low for a long period? Is there any technology change is actually making him perform low? That you have to see. If you know the root cause, then you will able to solve his problem, and then you may able to motivate him to perform better. And there is a one interesting thing I want to share. Sometimes we see a low performer, but maybe that is not the problem, because the whole team environment may be the problem. The team is performing in an environment where you are practicing some bad behavior. You are practicing that people will not open up. But this person has a good intention, and he is delivering right, and he is speak up, he is trying to deliver the right thing. But because of the team environment, he couldn't do it because, and he's, start, he's getting demotivated and he's performing low. So if you try to fix that person, you are actually doing, causing more problem. You are discouraging a good behavior, you are encouraging a bad behavior in the team, team environment. So unless you know the root cause, if you know the root cause, you can fix the team environment problem where other people also can open up and perform better. And this person also feel motivated that, okay, what I try to do, I can do it now. So it's really, really important to understand what is going on before you try to fix any, anything on the performance. And the high performers. This is the last one in the things. Uh, and high performers, we always think that, uh, I mean, this is really interesting because they already know how to motivate themselves. They already know how to challenge themselves. They know how to remove their blockers. They are very good at it. That's why they are high performers. And how are you going to motivate them? And how are you going to challenge them? So it is really important to understand them as a person. You have to interact with them more time, and you have to spend more time with them to understand what really motivates them, how you can gather those type of technology for them, or how you can gather those type of projects for them. If you have those information, then you can actually help him to grow more and challenge him more. There is one interesting area is that maybe that person has interest in a different team or maybe he wants to go for a different career path. You should encourage him. In a short term, you are losing one person, okay? You, you are encouraging him to go for another role. You're encouraging, encouraging him to go for another team. So in short term visibility, you are losing that person. But if you think about that, in a long term, you have two advantages. One is you are building a trust in your team. You're building that trust among the, your team members that my manager supports our career goal. My manager supports what we want to do in our career and our career path. At the same time, you're also making a friend. That's an additional benefit. So that, that, other than that, this trust is going to help you in long run to hire more people 
in your team because your team member is going to refer other people that, okay, you should work with this person. So we talked about hiring plan. We talked about briefly about how to build the team, motivate the team, and how we're going to evaluate the team. So that's all for today from me. And if you have any question, OK, yeah, go ahead. OK, uh, this is, I would say, for example, that from our different culture, you will see that there is a cultural uh, teaching. I have to repeat the question, sorry. Is you ask the question that how engineers open up, what I mean by open up. So in cultural point of view, that there is a teaching from the school and that you don't speak up even if you see something goes wrong. Goes wrong. And that actually build, become built in, in their entire life. So when they see that there is something going wrong, because of their cultural teaching, they don't speak up. Now, if you start making an environment that, OK, fine, he may speak slow. He may not have the communication skills. But OK, we'll, is a family, is a team, team then we, he, we can wait for him to share what is his thoughts. Slowly, you will get input from that person. That confidence you have to build on these guys who are not easily open up on their thoughts. Those guys who are not really vocal that, OK, something goes wrong. OK, you know, you, when you were talking about the technology, or architect talks about the technology, he said, OK, oh, this is bullshit. Just don't go for it, right? There is not like all of us, you will have that type of person in the team. So there are also person that they will see something goes wrong, but they will not say anything. But they have, may have a better solution for that. So if you can have an environment where everybody, and this one thing, like when he opens up or anybody else open up, if you have any feedback, you can do it in person rather than just use this in a, in the, in a forum so that he will not able to open up in the next time. So encourage him to speak up. Anyone has any other question? One, two, three. Okay. Thank you.